Hello everyone, welcome back to Hot Seat. I'm Omid Moradas from Tehran, and once again, I'm so happy to be with you all from this educational platform. And I'm super excited today because a dear friend and a master clinician from Brazil that I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with him, Ricardo Kern, is here with us from Brazil. Hello, Ricardo, welcome to Hot Seat, and thank you for accepting me. Yeah, I think a lot. It's a, 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 an honor and a pleasure to be here today, and especially uh, with this audience. I expect to have something meaningful to contribute with your practice and in your clinic part in this one hour and a half. So thank you a lot for inviting me. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And um, I was telling him personally but now i really wanted to say it officially that ricardo is uh without a doubt one of the genius practitioners in our field a true master clinician super skilled and you know there is it's not a compliment it's truth and i really recommend you all if not yet you should follow his page on instagram or on facebook and you can enjoy his materials the way he sees things and the way he executes his procedures, that how precise it is, how beautiful the documentation is. And I think this is the way that so many of the practitioners should follow if they can. So I'm super excited to have this great practitioner with us and I'm so blessed to call him a friend. So before we start, I would like to have Ricardo's CV for all of you and then we straightly go to the presentation and at the end we will have a good discussion on the topic. Dr. Kern graduated from the University Federal do Parana, one of the most prestigious universities in Brazil, obtained a postgraduate degree in periodontology in 2003 and a master's degree in oral rehabilitation from University Estadual de Ponta in 2007. I hope I pronounced them right. Firmly entrenched within the high aesthetic requirements of Brazilian dentistry, Dr. Kern focuses his work on the demanding disciplines of soft tissue design and reconstruction. He has a vast experience in immediate implant temporization from single tooth cases to full arch rehabilitations and has presented both didactic programs and reconstruction at numerous seminars and congresses. And the topic that he will present for us is actually one of the great topics in the field of soft tissue grafting and periodontal surgery, which is the roll flap technique. With that said, Ricardo, the platform is all yours and we are super excited to hear your beautiful presentation. Okay, thank you a lot. I After this amazing introduction, I, I, I hope to keep the, the level <laughs> of the expectation of everybody. So let me share my screen here and I'm going to go straight to the topic of the presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah. This is the right one. Uh, okay. Let me tell a little bit about the row flap. I think most people when they uh, see the talk and you're going to and understand a little bit what we are talking about uh, they expect that uh, really a, a simple procedures with not so much to to learn about but don't get that wrong i'm going to tell you a different way to see the row flap all the the range of applications that you can take from these really simple procedures uh you can really cover a great amount of uh, situations in your uh, daily basis implant cases and you're going to understand how amazing is this procedure so uh, don't expect little you expect a lot of 
about these uh, procedures and I'm going to cover that in this one hour and something. Uh, okay, what is about the row flap? Uh, first, when we starting to do implant placement, uh, what is the approach on the area that you're going to place your implant? Usually, I straight incision on the top of the crest, in the middle of the crest, and you're going to pull apart the buccal flap to the palatal flap, and you see a defect of this one here, and usually the places that you are fixing the implant on helix sides has more or less a little bit of deficiency on the soft tissue and the bone contour. On the traditional approach, uh, we're going to move a little bit this flap to the buccal side when I going to put back the two for the heel abutment or the customized abutment. And you're going to see that with the traditional approach, you're going to increment the volume of the soft buccal side, but just a little bit. You're not going to recover exactly the original shape and the volume uh, comparing uh, at the time of the natural tooth was there. So they start to develop a technique that uh, everybody calls row flap and they move this incision not on the top of the crest, they move this incision to the palatal side. But still, this incision was a straight incision from the distal margin of the premolar to the distal margin of the first molar, and they move all the tissue on the top of the crest to the buccal side. That's amazing in the point of view that you're going to compensate completely the volume on the buccal side, but you have some problems here. If you move all the tissue on the top of the crest, on the papilla area, you're going to, to have some exposition of the bone. It means that the tissue is going to heal by secondary intention there. Your papilla problem is not going to recover completely from the original uh, uh, height. And you're going to see that the maintenance of the papilla is going to be very, very important because these procedures, when I'm looking on the occlusal point of view, we are just thinking about uh, horizontal compensation of the volume. And these procedures indeed can compensate horizontal defect, but also a little bit in vertical compensation. You can bring this tissue more coronally, but for that, you need to preserve the papilla in place and make a modification of the design of the incision from the original technique. And you're going to understand pretty well how to do and the whys of this technique. So what are you going to do? We're going to just remove the tissue exactly in the area that are going to replace by a healing abutment, a temporary or customized abutment. On this occlusal view here, you see clearly the stem of my healing abutment. So exactly this shape here that I'm going to bring my incision and exactly this tissue that I'm going to move buccally. The incision you are going to bring that from the sulcus of the medial tooth, you're going to preserve as much as possible the volume of the papilla on the buccal side. And when you encounter exactly the diameter of your healing abutment that you're going to turn the incision to the palatal or lingual side, contouring exactly this rounded shape, and you're going to move back, back to the distal side. This way here, you have on the papilla side, the tissue preserved. So first intention healing, no exposition of the bone, and you're going to allow a vertical and horizontal augmentation and compensation of this defect here. So this is the drawing of the incision, of the regional incision. And we bring this incision from the sulcus of the proximal teeth. Why not doing a releasing incision in this kind of case? First, because you don't need to do a releasing incision. 
Second, a release incision is going to cut a lot of the tissue and maybe the pause off of the patient is not so good as bringing the incision to the sulcus. Third, when you do release incision, the compensation of the tissue is going to be or produce a edge from the area that you hold the tissue under to the side of your release incision. You're going to promote some scars on this area and some small defect that you're going to see exactly the place that you promote the release incision. So no release incision is needed. We bring this incision from the sulcus and our mantra is from the sulcus, you're going to design this incision, preserving as much as possible the shoulders of the papilla to the buccal side, okay? As buccally is possible to bring this incision, but respecting the mucogingival. You see here on this design that from the premolar, we brought on the blue line, this incision and these incisions almost get crossing to the black dashed line but I'm not cross over it. Why is that? Because I want on my flap to have a little bit of keratinized tissue on the flap and that is very important for us to maintain on a flap at least one millimeter of keratinized tissue. So this blue incision the dash incision here, you're going to maintain as buckly as possible, but always trying to keep at least one millimeter from keratinized tissue, one millimeter from the mucogingival line, right? So when you get this incision going distally and you came exactly to the diameter of your temporary or healing abutment that you're going to contour to the palatal lingual side, and return exactly in the same approach close to the molar. This way, papillas preserved, the defect is completely fulfilled, you have no exposition of the bone and you have a good adaptation of this tissue and a very nice healing for this patient. So here, be careful not to do exactly what is on this design. Sometimes we bring this incision to, to the middle of the crest to preserve the papilla. So there is not a good preservation of the shoulders of these papillas on the buccal side. And you're going to understand how important it is to have these papilla shoulders close to the buccal side. Uh, the finalization of these procedures here, you know, as you can see, you have exposition of the bone, so no papilla uh, was here. And more important than that, you see that we have the flap rolled under, right? So you clearly can see here on the occlusal view that we compensate it horizontally. But these procedures can bring the tissue coronally also. But I can have this tissue be brought vertically or coronally once I have some stability of the papilla there. There is no tissue that is going to stay, stay with no support in one side and no support in another side. So if you not maintain the papilla on the technique, the tissue that you rolled is going to retreat apically. You can compensate horizontally, but not more vertically. So that is important for us to maintain the papilla in place. Do not worry about, we're going to check on the clinical case, exactly good pictures showing they need to tell. So once you design the incision, do not reflect the flap, wait a little bit because usually we it does the incision and you just raise the flap straight away. Do not do that because now it's time for you to promote the deptilization of this tissue. Uh, and this is the right time. The right time that you design the incision so you can clearly see exactly which 
which area you can do the digitalization. And when it's still the tissue is just attached to the bone, to the ground, so it is stable. Once you reflect this flat, this tissue, and this tissue is not stable anymore, it's a kind of nightmare to try to do a good digitalization. When the tissue is moving, it's very difficult for us to do the digitalization. Especially uh, the way we, we are doing here with a high speed burn, fine grammature, not regular grammature, because regular grammature is uh, too rough. Uh, you cannot control how much tissue you are taking. Extra fine grammature sometimes take too long for you to do the digitalization. So fine grammature, more or less the shape of this the burn is good for us to use because you, you can with a lateral approach with the side of the burn you can start to promote the digitalization and after that with the tip of the burn you can really contour close to the incision promote the digitalization of this area. Once you have approached that you can really open your flap continues to do exactly as you are doing with your implant system with this drilling sequence that you get use exactly for your brand of implant and so on. And after that, implant in place, healing abutment in place, what are you going to do now? We're going to get this excess of tissue and fold this under the buccal side. Pretty simple. To fold that with a horizontal mattress, you're going to cover how to do that easily. And after that, what you're going to do is exactly as the row flap was not there. You're going to do simple interrupted sutures in the proximal sides of this implant and area, and that is done, okay? This is a nice technique, but you have been noticed that we remove exactly the tissue on the top of the crest that was replaced by the healing abutment. So I advise to you, to use this technique with a large healing abutment or a customized healing abutment when you add some composite in uh, the final abutment that you are using or even with the temporization. We do not use this technique with a smaller diameter healing abutment because you have no tissue to move from one place to another one or you're going to expose a lot of bones. So it's nice for you to see in your system exactly uh, larger healing abutments for you to use or customize abutments or whatever you're going to replace this area. Even with temporaries, we have some case nicely done, okay? So from this uh, small clinical case, let's start to develop our reasoning about this technique. Look at that, a large molar. And here you can see one point that I need to reassure you. We brought this incision from the sulcus. And as you can see, we try to maintain as much as possible of the shoulders of this papilla. It means that this incision was almost straight distally and measly and just turn to the lingual side when we get to the abutment diameter. Try not to bevel this incision and change the direction from the sulcus to the lingual side. Otherwise, you're not maintaining the shoulders of this papilla in the proper position. And you see that on the flap, I have at least one, one millimeter of, uh, of keratin inside tissue is still maintained. So the epitalization raise the flap and even in a large molar, this connective tissue is going to help me to compensate the defect. Horizontal mattress and now single interrupted sutures and I have compensated the volume of the tissue and also you're going to see some keratinization on the buccal side, right? Looking on the uh, occlusal view, you can see exactly what I'm talking about, the shoulders of the papilla, 
I just turn to the lingual side exactly to follow the diameter of the healing abutment. This shoulder is going to help me to have primary stability of the flap and give some stabilization of this flap, okay? So you can raise full thickness flap for cases like this one, and you're not going to need releasing incision for this case. Why is that? Because even in most of your case that you're going a great thickness of tissue that was available on the top of the crest, uh, you do not need additional releasing from this flap. Why is that? Look at the center picture of this slide. You see the contour of the tissue. As you have a defect, you have enough tissue projected to the inside of the crest to really, really accommodate the connective tissue that you're going to roll under this tissue. You see that as long this line, this line goes to the center of the crest, as much tissue you have to move to the buccal side, move to the outside of the crest. Uh, when you have no defect, so it's a straight line and you need or you want to accommodate connective tissue under that, augment the volume to the buccal side, in case like this one, you're going to need extra releasing from the sides to accommodate this tissue. So you need to read the defect. When you see a defect like this one, you know exactly that this tissue is available for you to just turn from inside to the outside without no need of extra releasing on this area. Pretty simple, full thickness flap. Don't worry, it's going to be an easy procedure for you to design, okay? A lot of people are concerned about these procedures because, uh, okay, Ricardo, you're going to roll the tissue under the buccal flap and all the keratinized tissue you're going to roll under the mucosa. So you're going to have just one, two millimeters of keratinized tissue, maybe it's not enough. It's not better for us to do, instead of a row flap, an apically repositioning flap in order to maintain all the keratinized belt. Uh, I don't think that uh, maybe the apical repositioning flap is going to give you the best that you can have from your procedures. Why is that? Because the row flap, when you design it right, you can gain in volume and also change the keratinized belt from this tissue. You can augment the keratinization once you perform this procedure right. So let's just check exactly what I'm intending to tell you. And I'm going to show a clinical case like this one here. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, uh, bring you some, some point of view here. Uh, I did for many years immediate implant placement all, all, all the month from anterior zone, lower, uh, upper molars, lower molars. And nowadays I'm pretty careful to choose the sites that I'm doing immediate implant placement. Why is that? Because there is some place that when I do immediate implants, implant placement, on the long run, I see that I lost a little bit of the keratin that was left there, especially in the lower molars and premolars. Because in the lower molars and premolars, we have around the natural crowns very little keratinized tissue. If you compare all, in all the mouth of is these teeth are exactly the ones that you have less keratinization comparing to the anterior ones or the upper molar. So when I do immediate implant, in this case, what you are doing, you are preserving the tissue. You preserve just a small amount of keratinized tissue, maybe this thin tissue and a small keratinized belt 
for an implant site is not exactly the perfect environment for you to maintain in the long run your implant because the keratinization is very important for the comfort of the patient when they are brushing and also to maintain a healthy tissue around your implant to preserve the bone, not to lose the bone during the years. You need not just thickness, but you need also a keratinized belt on this area. So what we do nowadays in lower molars, when I have just a small keratinized tissue, sometimes I prefer just to extract, let the tissue to heal itself, and to after that, I use the roof flap. Why is that? Because when I have the tooth present and just one, two millimeters of keratinized in thin tissue, if you extract and do immediate implant placement, you are going to just have this one, two millimeters of keratinized tissue on this area. Ah, Ricardo, but you can do a CT graft in this area to compensate that. Yes, you can, but let me show you my point of view. In a lower molar that you have a high degree of uh, occlusal uh, loading, that is not so easy for you to really drill in the middle of these two roots. You have to deal with a lot of uh, risk during this procedure. If I need to add for these procedures more one CT graft in this case, I think it's too much for me to offer for this patient. And instead of that, if I just extract, even you do not need to use biomaterial, and wait for only two months, and you're going to re-enter this area, you can have all the keratinized tissue back on the top of the crest, and you can promote the row flap. You're going to end up with more keratinized tissue than you need for a case like this one. So we simplify our risk, we diminish the risk and simplify all these procedures here. So cases that I had done many years ago, after I check it 10 years, uh, 15 years, I have the implant preserved, that's okay, but there's no keratinized tissue. The real the little remodelations that I have during these 10 years move the small curtains I tissue that I had under this crown. So almost all the crown is contoured by mucosa, not curtains I tissue. So I do not use immediate implant placement in lower molars and premolars when I see thin phenotypes. In case like this one here, we apply immediate implant placement. Why is that? Because I have really a large keratinized belt with a thick phenotype. So you can really go with immediate implant placement because what you have at the beginning is already enough for you to maintain during the years the perfect pair implant tissue with good and thick phenotype. Okay, so you can really preserve because I have at the starting point, the ideal amount of bone I need. If I do not have the, the good amount of tissue, I'm going to extract and promote the row flap after that. And that is exactly what I'm, I, I, I was talking about, that the row flap can give you augmentation in the volume, but also promote keratinization. And you're going to see this case exactly as I'm going to talk to you. So incision from the sulcus, preserve as much the shoulders of the papilla without crossing the mucogingival line. And now I'm going to contour exactly the diameter of this healing abutment. And you see a very large defect. I have here maybe the mucogingival line almost going to the middle of the crest. I have here available for me to roll under the buccal flap four to five millimeters of tissue that had pristine keratinization on this top. Okay, it's not much, but maybe is enough. So we raise the flap here 
And now I'm going to roll this flap under the buckle flap. You are seeing something different here. You are seeing that we split this tissue, letting the periosteum still attach it to the bone, okay? Hold this information that you're going to work with this information in just a little bit uh, of pictures, okay? So now I let the periosteum here. You see my row flap being turned under the buckle flap and with a horizontal mattress and two uh, single interrupted sutures, we close everything. What is the outcome of these procedures? If you check it out, you're going to ask that I let just uh, maybe two millimeters of keratinized tissue. It's not much. I think around the implant is the minimum, minimum that you must to have of keratin around the implant. But you can agree that under the mucosa, I had the connective tissue that was rolled from the top of the crest. So let's see if this connective tissue under this mucosa can really maybe promote a, a differentiation of these cells and promote some keratinization of this process. Seven days, occlusal view, 20, 21 days, three weeks. What is happening here? You, you see that the keratin layer is increasing. So from two millimeters, maybe now I'm going to close four millimeters, four millimeters and a half. That is more than enough for me to preserve a nice tissue around this implant. So the row flap has this ability, not just to increment the volume, but to change the phenotype that you are working with. And you're going to work in some very important points of flap management for you to have this kind of results. Uh, when I, I start to talk about row flap, uh, I told you, uh, pay attention because it's not just about this simple technique. It's a whole concept because what you're going to apply here, you can apply for your case of root covering, for your case that you are grafting uh, on the huge defect when you are grafting connective tissue from the tuberosity, that you want to have the best of the result of your uh, surgery, talking about maintaining what you are just grafting. And you are talking about not just maintain volume, but you are talking about how to modify the phenotype of the tissue that you just brought your graft to increase the keratinization of this area also. So what are the points that we need to manage and pay attention to have this kind of result? And you're going to use the row flap as the perfect example for us to bring this subject. So from this starting point to a nice amount of keratinization here, so I can have this tissue is stable and if the patient do the minimum to take care for many, many years okay so this picture here is going to summarize exactly what i'm going to try to tell you uh, we do not have the whole time of the world to bring this but it is that is going to enlighten something uh and you're going to apply it for all the kind of soft, soft tissue surgeries you do let me ask you something when you bring a connective tissue under a flap right? What's the idea? Not just gain volume, as I said, but also try to have some keratinization on the surface, right? But if I bring a connective tissue and cover with a flap here, the idea is that this connective tissue may influence the cells on the surface of this flap. But if I have or I need to have the connective tissue influence the surface, how long is the way for this tissue or this connective tissue influence the surface? Because sometimes you bring the connective tissue under periosteum, connective tissue and 
mucosa. Sometimes you let the periosteum on the ground and you brought the connective tissue over the periosteum. Oh, that's right, because now I do not have the periosteum on the way. It means that my connective tissue is closer to the surface. Sometimes you bring a connective tissue, you let the periosteum on the ground, and you bring the flap. And when you bring the flap, you have, of course, a part of keratin on this flap, and another part of the flap is mucosa. Let me ask you something. What you have under the mucosa? Muscles. According to the way you manage the flap preparation, sometimes you have over your connective tissue, not just mucosa, but you have a layer of muscles over the connective tissue graft. The muscles is a kind of a barrier not letting your connective tissue to promote any modification on the surface of your tissue. And not just a mechanical barrier, because muscles moves a lot. And you know, not just about bone grafting, but soft tissue grafting also, that mechanical stability is way important for you to have the best result of your grafting. So if you look again to this picture here, what are you going to see? I have removed the frenum for this case and I catch a very nice picture that summarizes what I'm intending to do. On this picture here, you have, as is a tunnel, a small part of the keratin maintained around these central incisors. And after three millimeters, you see a dashed line that is the mucogingival line. It means that apical to that, we have originally mucosa, muscles, to the periosteum. What is the idea? The idea is to have my graft, my connective tissue graft, under the mucosa, without the barrier or the interference of the muscles. So when we prepare this tissue, we remove the attachment of the muscles from this mucosa. Okay, Ricardo, but if you just do that, you're still going to have the muscles attached on the periosteum, and you're going to bring your connective tissue over the muscles, not stable also. And really, the best environment for me to lay down a connective tissue is over the periosteum. So you can also layer in and split the muscle from the periosteum. Now, your site prepared to receive your connective tissue as a clean periosteum without muscles, very nice for my CT graft. And to cover and to protect my CT graft, I have the mucosa, also without the muscles interference. This we call know how to layering the recipient area with completely separation of different tissues, mucosa from muscles, muscles from periosteum. And you're going to see that each of these environments are perfect for a different proposition. You're going to see that in some cases, I can graft over the periosteum with a connective tissue graft, uh, like a sandwich between periosteum and mucosa to have a soft tissue graft. And I can even have bone graft under the periosteum. Okay, you're going to understand that. Let's just develop and how to do this layering uh, in case like this one. So this picture or this sequence is exactly for us to catch that. Nice molar, a lot of keratinization on the top. You need to promote the roll flap to have at least four to five millimeters of keratin on the top of the crest. I think maybe 60 to 70% of our case, we have that available for you to manage, especially in the maxilla, because in the maxilla, as you turn to the palate, you have a lot of keratin. You can even go further and take more connective tissue. I'm going to show you just in two cases. Okay, uh, here my large healing button. We are stamping the area. You can use a, 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 a mark pencil and really contour on your healing abutment, get it upside down 
and you're going to stamp over the tissue. If your stamp is not right, you can just catch a, a cotton ball and just to raise and stamp it again. It is going to guide you your incision, not just guide your incision because after you raise your flap, you're going to realize that your incision is exactly a guide for you to drill in the center. So you're going to help you to position pretty well your implant also. So I have my stamp here and from the sulcus, we're going to preserve as much as possible the papilla and you're going to turn and return to the distal margin again, bringing this papilla as much as possible to the muckle at the buccal side without cross over the mucogingival line. Uh, there is important points here, okay? Usually this contour you cannot uh, done pretty well with the 15C because as is a straight blade, you can have the proper angle to do this incision. So we use a 12 uh, blade to do this contour, this lingual contour. And one more important point here, you have noticed maybe in the first case and in, in the case, the previous case, that we left a papilla about one millimeter and a half. Ricardo, you're going to have any crosses of the papilla? Not at all. Because the papilla or all the tissue that contours a crown, they survive or they are nourished by the periodontal ligament blood flow. Okay, the main blood flows of the tissue that contours the crown is exactly the blood, the, 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 the nourishment that came from the periodontal ligament. If you have one millimeter of the tissue around the crown, but you do not damage or cut the blood flows of the periodontal ligament, this tissue is going to survive. That uh, works when you are harvest a palatal tissue, as an example. How far away can you start from the margins? Uh, you can go as close as possible at, at the margin of a molar or premolar on the palate. If you not cut the periodontal ligament, that tissue is going to be preserved. So you need just to preserve and be careful because on the posterior zone, when you bring a, a straight blade like a 12, you in the surface has like one, two millimeters on the tooth. But the tip of the blade, if you have some beveling or some tilting of this blade, maybe the point or the tip of the blade is cutting the periodontal ligament and that's going to have some necrosis of the tissue. So in this kind of a situation, we use a 12 blade to design well the incision. After that, the epitalization, it's pretty fast. I think is the easiest way for us is to use a high speed burr. And with the, 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 the tip of the blade, you can contour close to the incision to remove a residual of the epithelium that maybe had left in this area. So now we can raise the flap, okay? And now what are we going to do for this case? We are not going to do full thickness flap, okay? When do you start your case and you are giving the first step in soft tissue management, go to full thickness flap. You're going to increment the volume, maybe get a little bit of curtainization, it's going to be easy for you, and you're going to collect nice result. But as you improve and you handle this kind of technique, you can go to the next step. That is exactly what I'm going to show here. What are you going to do? You're going to raise full thickness flap, in the keratinocyte tissue. Apical to the keratinocyte tissue, apical to the mucogingival line, you're going to layer in this tissue, splitting mucosa from muscles and taking away the muscles from the periosteum. Okay, exactly what I'm intending to talk to you on that very nice tunneling lateral picture. So here we raise full thickness flap pretty close to the mucogingival line. What you have here, you see the bone and the flap on the buccal side is still attached to the lateral contour of the bone contour. So the periosteum is attached to this tissue here. What are you going to do? We're going to layer it. This is a very tricky 
area for you to do a work with your blade. Why is that? Because the tissue is thin. I'm very concerned about not perforating this flap. So we're going to give you some tips to handle this area in a secure way. How are you going to do? Look the tissue from the occlusal side to do the first incision. When you do the first incision, what you are cutting here? You are cutting the periosteum and you're going to cut the periosteum only. How is the thickness of this periosteum? Not more than one millimeter. It means that you do not need to bring this incision more than two millimeters inside this tissue. One millimeter, just the cutting part of your blade. And you're going to bring this incision one millimeter deep, close to the bone crest. And you're not going to perforate any tissue because you are just one millimeter deep on the flat. Okay? When you cut the periosteum, you're going to separate the apical part of the periosteum from the part of the periosteum that is stood on the flap. And you're going to separate a little bit. When you separate a little bit this, also the mucosa on the buccal side came one millimeter away from this periosteum on this area. Let me be sincere, if just one millimeter the mucosa from this area, you already gain one millimeter of safe to do the second incision. This tissue sometimes has two millimeter thickness. If you augment one millimeter the distance from this area, go millimeters is a great amount of tissue for you to bring a second incision. Now you're going to bring one, two millimeter deeper than the first one. Okay, same direction. And after that, if you continue to go deeper with your blade, you're going to go in the muscles area. It means you can cut in the middle of the muscles, letting muscles on the mucosa and muscles on the, over the periosteum. That's not good because you want to have your connective tissue graft over the periosteum, not over the muscles and you want to cover your connective tissue with mucosa, not with the muscles. So what are you going to do? You're going first take the muscles from the mucosa. It means that your incision is going to be close to the surface. And now you stop looking the tissue from the occlusal and you're going to see the, the, the tissue from the side, exactly as you see here on this picture. Why is that? Because as you are running your blade close to the surface and deep on the tissue, if you try to look from occlusal, you're not going to see the tip of your blade working and you can perforate this tissue. But if you look from the lateral view, you can see by translucency the presence and the work of your blade. And read, read, read it. Your blade is going to be pretty close to the surface and you can cut and really detach the muscles from the mucosa don't worry about because as this tissue you have some elasticity on the mucosa your blade can come close to the surface and the elasticity of this tissue is not going to allow the blade to perforate the mucosa you have some room to do this work and as you look in from the side you can really see if your blade is close to the surface ocean too much the, the, the surface or if you are deep on the muscles, and you can control this splitting, really, really detaching all the mucosa from the muscles. This is very nice, okay? So now you have no, no muscles on the mucosa, you're going to see that you're going to have a, a huge releasing of this tissue. You can apply that for many different techniques, for root covering or else, you're going to apply in your CT graph, tunneling or whatever, or whatever is exactly what we, we approach this layering of this tissue. Okay, what you have now, the muscles is still attached to the periosteum. If you can or if you want to improve more this area, you're going to take the muscles from the periosteum. Exactly as we prepare a periosteum to receive a free gingival graft, okay? You just cut close to the periosteum. And here, we just 
checking if I still have some muscles attached to the mucosa with a blunt instrument and going further in, in Tunisia. And now I'm going to bring the mucosa, stretching the mucosa. My assistant is pulling it apart because you want to check exactly where the muscles attach to the periosteum. And now you're going to do a, a third incision that is close to the bone contour over this uh, uh, periosteum to take in and away the muscles from this uh, ground. Okay, so now we have a perfect environment to do your row flap or if it was the case, a CT graft or whatever, right? That's nice point and we're going to use that to the next case. This sequence of drilling from your case, not much news here. What I'm going to bring is something about the sutures. So you're going to see a occlusal view and a lateral view of the sutures here. And you're going to just talk about the sutures of the row flap, right? So this is a horizontal mattress. A horizontal mattress is a suture that is going to cross the tissue folded from the surface to the inner layer of this tissue and you're going to return a little more distally in the same horizontal level. This is in the same horizontal level is a horizontal mattress. And you do not need to tight it much, but you know, when you close your knot, your tissue is going to be ready for the interproximal sutures. Single interrupted sutures, you don't need anything fancy than and that to really close this area. Right, according to the interproximal space, one single suture is enough each uh, side. Sometimes when I work with a very large molar, we have two sutures of that, but uh, enough for us to have the tissue closed. So this is uh, a single inter suture here. No, no big deal, right? So let's move. And one trick here, okay? The tip is hold this tissue already folded in position with a micro plier. It's nice to have really a plier that the tip is very thin because if you have a large plier, the area that sometimes you want to do this, the, 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 the suture here, you are holding with the plier. So a thin plier is going to allow you to really choose the best place to cross with your suture. And when you fold this tissue, be careful to fold it in the proper position. Some people fold it too much the row, going with the out keratinized tissue under the mucosa. It means that you're going to have, when you close the flap, mucosa all over your implant. And you need to let at least one, two millimeters of keratinized tissue exposed to the outside. So fold it and handle it in the proper position and your sutures are going to cross in and out, holding in the position of the perfect relationship of keratinized exposed and amount of connective tissue hidden under this flap. And after that, single interrupted suture, okay? Look nice, the periosteum preserver there, and let it heal, and I have a nice result to send this patient back for uh, the, the dentist that referred the case for me, okay? Uh, I'm going to make an invitation for you guys. I have a lot of uh, different and clinical case on my page on Facebook. It's a page specific for soft tissue management, clinical cases. So all full protocol we have uh, sometimes a hundred pictures step by step of the case. So my invitation for you to follow the page and access. Um, there is many, many nice cases there. So it, it's going to be a pleasure to have you there. And if you want to send questions and maybe uh, some questions about the case that you have been posted, you, you have a lot of information on that, right? So at this point, with the basic of the row flap, 
we understand how to apply, how to design, how to layer in this technique. But when you have two implants, how is the, the modification? Is the same thing. What is our mantra? Bring the incision from the sulcus, serve as much as possible the papilla before doing the contour of this incision. If you have two implants to place, what are you supposed to have between two implants? Papilla. So we're going to design exactly the papilla between the two implants. And you're going to maintain the papilla as much as possible in the buccal contour without crossing the mucogingival line. Look in the center of the picture, you're going to see that I still have one millimeter of keratinized tissue maintained on the flap. And these two rows is going to be enough to compensate all the defect that I have for a case like this one. All the rest is more the same, okay? The epitalization, raise the flap. Here's a case that you are splitting the tissue to uh, have more releasing of this area because it's really, really a thick connective tissue that was available for us on the top of the crest. So, and once again, the incision just go on the surface of the periosteum. After that, you're going to go one millimeter deeper. And after this second incision, we we'll start to see the tissue from the lateral view exactly as we have been saw on the last case, right? So tissue is ready. Now the drilling sequence to implant in place and our horizontal mattress, one horizontal mattress, each row part, okay? One horizontal mattress and second one. After that, single interrupted sutures and close everything. All the deficiency compensates, all the keratinization needed exactly return to the ideal state for this patient. One more modification, right, from this technique. Sometimes, the volume that you need to rebuild is too much if you are just seeing the tissue that is on the top of the crest. And I'm going to show different, two different ways compensate this huge this defect, okay? One is with additional connective tissue. Second one is with bone grafting. And the two ways are so nice for us to work. Look at the size of this defect. When you see this side from, from Oculus of View, it's huge. I do not have probably enough connective tissue if I design just the row flap with the stamp it of a stamp of my healing abutment is not going to be enough to compensate all this defect. Look at the lateral view here. And almost do not see the turn of the tissue to the palatal side. So he it really, really is a huge defect. Okay, remember that I start to talk to you in the beginning that you can compensate the tissue horizontally and you also can compensate vertically. And this is the case for us to realize that. How much I can bring this tissue coronally? You can bring this tissue coronally until the level of the papillas. If you see from the molar to the premolar, this level of the papilla is the maximum that you can bring this tissue coronally. If the papilla was a little more coronally, probably I can bring the flap more coronal. If you have no papilla and the papilla was way apically, you cannot bring this tissue more coronal. Why is that? Because the papilla is the mechanical support of your tissue. Without this mechanical support and also the nourishing, but mainly the mechanical support, the flap do not hold in place. That's why it's important you design the incision maintaining the shoulders of this papilla in place, right? So every time you see a case like this one and you starting to realize how much you can bring the cervical margin contorn of this molar, pay attention on this papilla is the maximum that you can bring this cervical contour coronary. 
if your tissue is retreated, the papilla is retreated, is the level that you can do. Another observation that is very important. You see in the lateral mouth view of the mouth corridor, the mouth corridor itself, when you have some uh, defect on the papilla, that is not so important for your case and for your patients uh, as the cervical margin. Because the papilla deficiency, you almost can see on the mouth corridor. But the cervical margin, if you have the cervical margin three, four millimeters more apically, what you're going to see, a very long molar, a very long premolar. And that is a very huge aesthetic problem for this patient. So this is a perfect technique for you to use in the posterior area, in the mouth corridor, because the row flap is a technique that you preserve the papilla. You're not rebuilding this papilla. It means if you have defect of the papilla, does not matter. And you can really fix the cervical margin and bring this tissue. This is not a technique that we usually apply on the anterior zone. Why is that? Because on the anterior aesthetic zone, if I have a small defect on the papilla and I'm going to fix my implant and bring this a new crown, this small defect on the papilla sometimes is a problem for your patient. You have the black space here or the shadow of the absence of the papilla. So I just apply the row flap on the static zone when I check from the beginning if the volume of the tissue on the papilla area is exactly the volume that I want to end up with my case. Because if I have defect on the papilla, the row flap is not my choice. I'm going to use another technique that allows me to build up not just the cervical margin volume, but also the papilla site is another technique, not the row flap, okay? So pay attention on the position of your papilla. If you have a small defect, you can apply that on the posterior zone. That is not going to be a problem for your case. And you're going to fix the cervical margin until exactly the level of the papilla. Right? If you understand that, I think you're going to at least apply the technique for the right cases. Because we can really do and design the technique pretty well, but if you're indicated the, technician, the technique in the wrong situation, we already fail from the beginning. So this is a case that you can apply the technique, okay? Look at this stamp. Oh, Ricardo, look in the occlusal view is too little connective tissue. Remember, we can fix with bone or connective tissue. This case is connective tissue. So we can do what? Maybe take the tuberosity, maybe open the trap door on the palate and take more connective tissue, add with the row flap and compensate this whole volume. That is right. If you are thinking in open a trap door on the palate, why not design this trap door exactly beside the row flap contour and take the connective tissue with the extension of these incisions? Let's see how that works. This is the area that I'm going to open my trap door, the split thickness area, the area that I'm going to open a window, a flap that under this split thickness area, look at the view. We just split the palatal side of this tissue. We're going to raise this flap, and under this flap, I'm going to bring my incision from the sulcus, preserving the papilla, but instead doing the contour on the palatal side. We're going to bring this incision of the row flap way deep on the palatal side, grabbing and harvest additional connective tissue from this area. Look at that. We raise the flap and you see the papilla, but you're not seeing the contour of this incision exactly on the stamped area. This incision is going way to the palatal side. 
this additional connective tissue is pediculated. This is very good because there is some source of nourishment from the flap and we're going to use to really compensate all the volume that is needed, right? So this is step by step of my sinus lift procedures. We raise the sinus through the crest here and Okay, uh, sinus done, and what to go about the roll flap? Okay, is here, sinus in place. Okay, return to the roll flap. What we have, a very long flap, a very ro long roll. What we can do, this extended connective tissue is going to allow me to give a long turn of the roll, okay? Because if I have just two, three minutes of connective tissue, as I saw in the beginning, what you need to do, you need to do a, a short turn of the tissue. You're going to have some volume compensation, but you cannot bring this flap coronally. You just can bring this flap coronally when you have some extension of the tissue that it's available, the connective tissue. Design that, it means that you have a long turn instead of short turn. You see, so this extension on the palatal side allowed me to give this turn of the, the row flap on the level of the interproximal papilla. So I, I was able to really brought this tissue uh, with the cervical margin at the level of the interproximal papillas. If I have just a small connective tissue, uh, this turn probably is going to have at least three millimeters more AP. I still going to have vertical defect. And if there is no papilla on the, the initial design here, the tissue is not going to be stable by the papillas and you're going to have precession because there's no tissue that is going to stay on the original position if there is no mechanical support in one side and no mechanical support on the other side. Sutures, occlusal view here of my uh, result. Horizontal mattress, simple sutures, one week follow-up, a small necrosis of the donor site, not a big deal, just a small, and tissue healing. And after almost half a year, I have the perfect arrangement to send this patient back for the referee. And, and you see the level, the amount of tissue fixed with one single uh, procedure, right? So this is nice for us to, to follow uh, the possibility of this, this kind of procedure. Right, let's move for the huge defect that now we can use bone grafting together with the row flap, right? So this case here was a case that we managed the full arch of the patient, tooling, implants, and so on. But in this premolar, the 24-25 area here, we applied the row flap technique. So it was the first surgery we have been doing for this patient. Look, the occlusal view is a huge defect. The whole flap is not itself going to promote the full compensation of this area. And this is a case that we're going to use additional grafting in, in this case. Look, again, the mouth corridor, the turn of this bone defect, and two implants, so double row, and preserve the papilla between this area. The epitalization, you know by, by heart now everything you have been telling here. And okay, I raised full thickness flap to see the bone contour, to fix my implant in the proper position, checking the, uh, the long axis of my implant, an implant of 3.5 and another one of 4.3 millimeters. And you see on the first premolar that I have just a thin layer of the bone left. So I need to graft that with biomaterial. Let me ask you something. When you do uh, bone grafting, 
What do you like to cover your bone grafting? I think the least uh, way to cover and to protect a bone grafting is with a connective tissue graft rolled over that. So that's not the perfect tissue to cover and to protect bone grafting. What is the natural tissue that you would like to really protect your biomaterial? Periosteum, right? The periosteum has completely different properties than the mucosa or the connective tissue grafting. First of all, you have the proper cells environment to recovering to heal your biomaterial, not the connective tissue graft. Another one, the mechanical stability. You know you handle already the periosteum. Periosteum is a stable mm -hmm. tissue with uh, not, is not, do not have a lot of elasticity. It means when you suture the periosteum, the periosteum can be really tight with the sutures and maintain the biomaterial is stable on this area. With or without a collagen membrane, the periosteum is your tissue to cover the biomaterial. If you cover biomaterial with mucosa or CT graft, it's not stable. There's not the proper cells to heal the area. It's not the right environment. So what are you going to do in this case? We're going to layer the tissue in different environments. I'm going to split the mucosa in the CT graft with the muscles and I'm going to let the periosteum on the ground. And when I roll my connective tissue, my connective tissue is going to stay on the surface of the periosteum. It means that under the periosteum, I can raise the periosteum and have periosteum and bone and grafting between this area. So all the technique is the same. Row flap, the epitalization. And now let's separate and split each one of this tissue. Periosteum from muscles and mucosa. So one single incision close to the surface and after that you're going to go deeper exactly as we have been discussing before. So now I have two different environments. One for connective tissue grafting and another one for hard material, bone grafting, biomaterial with bone that we collected from the drilling area. And this is the different environment. We mixed the, the biomaterial with the, um, the, the autologous bone collected from the drills and we're going to accommodate this bacterial under the periosteum. We can discuss about one hour the need to use a collagen membrane here or not. And I'm going to tell you in the cases, in the cases that I'm not going to open this flap anymore, that I'm just going to fill a volume with biomaterial and not re-enter the area to do implant and so on. And when I'm covering this graft material with a healthy and stable periosteum, I not use a collagen membrane, okay? In case that I'm going to re-enter the area, fix implant, I use an additional collagen membrane. But here, in this case, you're going to see that I, I could cover all the biomaterial, and more than that, with a very stable periosteum, mechanically stable. Uh, the mechanical stability of the graft is one of the most important things that you need to have success in your grafting, okay? not the kind of membrane that you are using. You see that bone grafting is succeed for many years using different kind of materials. Collagen membrane uh, with uh, long-term reabsorption, short-term, titanium mesh, teflon, whatever. They work once they have some principle of the surgical and one of these principles is mechanical stability. If it moves a lot, not going to work. In case like this one that you 
see the periosteum is enough to give this stability, I do not think going to use any additional material. And the nice part is suturing periosteum is different than suture mucosa and CT graft. Why is that? Periosteum, there is no elasticity on the periosteum. You can really use uh, a, a, a three zero uh, suture and you're going to really tight it more than when you are suturing mucosa. Mucosa, a lot of elasticity. You cannot really tight the knot or the sutures. You need to use a more delicate suture and you cannot have tension in your soft tissue suture. Every option, you can go and really, really tight it more and give more stability. So I have here two horizontal mattress, uh, just suturing the periosteum. So first layer of suture, there's nothing to do with the roll flap. The first layer of suture is just to close the periosteum with the biomaterial. So when this lateral view is nice, that you can realize the different environments that we are working with. I have the roll flap, put a part the roll flap, and you're going to do the sutures just on the periosteum. So biomaterial between bone and periosteum. Now my horizontal mattress. The only thing that you must pay attention when you are doing this horizontal mattress is that the suture must engage from the surface of the periosteum to the inside of the periosteum and return that. Why is that? Because the border of your uh, periosteum, when you engage from the surface, these sutures just close the border of the periosteum on the top of the biomaterial. If you engage from inside, the border of the, the, the periosteum stays loose and you're not going to close proper the air. If you understand this sequence, that's nice because the roll flap sutures we have been seeing before, okay? So two horizontal mattress, pretty tight, stable, close, and now uh, roll flap horizontal mattress, close here, and you're going to do after this step, single interrupt sutures. It's a case that we are applied for this patient. Immediate temporization, so there is the temporary. Be careful, the temporary not compress the soft tissue, so that is this weird emergence profile not to compress, let this tissue heal after this tissue is mature with the blood flow that you're going to change this uh, emergence profile during, uh, during our conditioning of this tissue. So this I think is with 45 days, 60 days, I'm not sure. And this is with the final delivering of this case. How the front part so, but also this premolar with the tissue condition. It's amazing, amazing procedure because we compensate with the volume of the soft tissue. We change the phenotype, augmented the keratinoside layer because we work and we layer this tissue in the proper environment. And we still have the bone grafting on the right place. So that's why I told in the beginning, the roll flap is not uh, something, ah, Simple. No, you can apply in the amazing different kind of situation. And the skills that you're going to train here are the skills that are going to give you the next level for all kind of soft tissue surgeries that you can apply for this patient. Okay, so thank you all. I think we had over in one hour and 25 minutes. A uh, lot of uh, small information. I appreciate all uh, your attention here. And we have some time now for the Q&A session. So you have some doubts. Uh, is the time for you to make the question for us, right? So. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Um, Great. First of all, thank you. Accepting and also your beautiful, comprehensive, very detailed, explained presentation. I think after this presentation, I told you at the beginning the way that you describe and go through every step with clear 
photos and with your drawings, it's a unique opportunity for so many of people watching this kind of a presentation learned a lot from you. And me personally, it was a great update for me and you showed that we can really think out of the box. And usually I think that maybe this procedure is very limited to specific situations, but the way that you showed, we can expand the use of this procedure and go lots further try to solve the deficiency with less procedures because in the robot technique, it's not really needed to go from other areas and harvest graphs and come back. And just with good design and execution, we can gain a great for our patient. So first of all, thank you for that. And me personally have a question regarding uh, the way that you described how you measure release the flap. So you said that at first incision, we are going under the mucosa. And in the second incision, we are separating muscles from the periosteum. So my question is now this, what, what will happen to that inner, I mean, the intermediate space, which is the muscle? Should we cut it and bring it out or, or just by going around it, it will stay there? Yeah, uh, perfect. Just let just let it go because uh, this this uh, engagement of the muscles when once free uh, problem this part of the muscles gladly is going to diminish and uh, the, the muscles fibers maybe is going to how can I say that in English uh, is going to lose the, the, the mass the, 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 the volume of this area it's not going to interfere in anything and uh, I already tried sometimes to cut the muscles inside to take it out. And I think I caused more damage and caused a bad pause up for the patient than try just to, to let it go. So there's no, 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 no big deal. You just detach them from both area and uh, that, that's it. Uh, some people ask me uh, also about this, uh, when you, you split the muscles from the because you see the blade so you are really in a very thin uh, part of the flap but the flap is not going to have any necrosis because on the mucosa the blood vessels stay really on the surface of the mucosa you see your blade and over your blade you see a lot of blood vessels here so you you can really work with a thin flap here and the flap is going to survive uh, what you cannot do is really work close to the surface on the keratinized part of your flap because on the keratinized part of the flap the blood vessels stay really really inside the flap if you let a thin uh, work this keratinized area of the flap that indeed you're going to cause a necrosis of this part of the flap so in keratinized tissue Splitting is as close as to the periosteum when you do that. So you let the total amount of the tissue on this area. On the mucosa, you can work close to the surface. And that is amazing because when you detach completely the muscles, you see the releasing of the flap. It's amazing. When you try to cover long root exposed and you do well this splitting, the tissue just came gently and passive way for you to suture there's no pull muscular pull on the healing it's uh it's again changing when you you start to see this different and applying different techniques is uh it's amazing i think it's uh, uh, a nice contribution for our our techniques uh on soft tissue knowing how to to work on the exactly. different layers and also record you talked about uh, the road inside so it was clear but but one thing is that because some practitioners they have differences in the amount of uh, degree of uh, rolling it inside so um, should we should we uh, think about if we want to increase the height of the tissue 
for making a decision or it just depends on the amount of uh, region that we want to fold it inside. I don't know if my question was clear, but for example, if I want to roll it like, or if I want to roll it completely like this, you know, the amount of bending the tissue inside, folding the tissue inside, what should be the criteria for that decision? Because sometimes when the people want to tie the knots, they um, unintentionally bring the tissue to the AP. Okay. Uh, first, the amount of uh, tissue that you are rolling under the flap, okay? Uh, usually, uh, I take this decision based on how often active tissue, sorry, uh, keratinized tissue I'm going to let on the surface, okay? I cannot hide in all the connective tissue under this area. I let one millimeter, two millimeters of connective tissue on uh, keratin tissue on this area. If you hold everything under and you let the mucosa, you know how we to suture just mucosa. Especially if you split it, everything mucosa from muscles in, it, it, two days after that, probably your sutures, it just is going to tear apart your, uh, your tissue. So it's always better and more stable for us to have a suture in a flap on the keratinized area or on the periosteum. On this way, as we split the periosteum apart on the keratinized tissue. Well, this is the first thing. So once this is set and you really split and release apically, you can put this tissue here or here or there. You can bring it, Coraline, no problem, because it's the same way when you are covering a root exposed. Once you release the tissue, you can bring it more Coraline or not, which is the perfect level until the level of the papillas. Because if you let it apically, oh, you could be better on the cervical margin. If you bring it more coronally, it doesn't not work. Because in some days, this tissue is going to collapse ended up on the level of the papilla. So usually you see the level of in the proximal papilla, bring in that suture, and that's okay. And that, the single interrupted suture is going to exactly bring the tissue on the, the proper level. So this uh, uh, is the way we balance and position the flap. Exactly, exactly. Information. And my, my last question regarding the the want to do PBR at the same time. So I think the, the thing that you showed was something um, that we can say it was like a periosteal flap, if I'm right, and um, doing the grafting between the periosteum and the bone. So usually in what situation, I mean, in what amount of bone that you want to regenerate, you decide to go with this technique. Do you have any number, for example, for millimeters of bone grafting? Will it work? Because we don't have enough uh, ability to release the periosteum to cover. We only have an envelope for the ability with bone graft material. So in what extent uh, we are able to increase the bone with this technique? Okay. That is a great question, but uh, let me answer you something. Uh, it's silly, it's very silly, but I think it's the best way for the people to understand, okay? Let me do a C-shaped area. Uh, how long is this distance here? It's straight, from here to here. Short, right? It's short. I got, how is the distance from the C? It's a long way. I have probably the double of distance here than here. Yeah. Imagine as a bone defect. And we are working in between two natural crowns. Usually you have a C-shaped defect. When you detach the periosteum here, as large as the C-defect 
as much as you have of periosteum available for you to cover the bone grafting that you are using. So it's easier for you to cover the bone grafting from this large defect if you have a defect, a yeah, straight line, and you're going to increase the tissue here. If you want to increase the tissue here, you're going to need more to release down deep there and bring periosteum because you don't have enough periosteum. So usually on the flap technique that you are working between natural crowns, you're working with this kind of defect and you'll not have problem to really have enough periosteum to cover the bone grafting that you are using. And if you are grafting to have the natural profile, it brings that you are bringing the bone here, not there. And it's enough for you to cover and have primary closure of the, the, the bone graft. Sometimes I have, and according to the splitting, if I start to split to apical, and not enough periosteum to prevent everything. But if you give a stability, a small part of the biomaterial exposed is not a big, a big deal. And you can have a little bit. I have some cases, uh, a lot of documented cases from row flap, and uh, I do not have the proper time to bring out the, the small pieces of the game, but uh, no problem at all. You can, yeah. can apply. Because that was the thing that I thought about. As you said, maybe, maybe if we do the graph with the large with periosteum covered on one side and the bone on the other side, maybe if some part of the graph is from the coronal end, there won't be any problem. It, it acts like, like, a, like a contained defect. So the bone can be formed, have a chance to close it, and have the coverage, and it works perfectly. My friend, Ricardo, once again, I want to thank you for your time, for your questions, and going through the detail. As I said, you are truly a genius in my eyes, and I'm pretty sure all the audience have enjoyed this presentation. Really looking forward to seeing you very soon, my friend. And till that moment, stay safe, have fun, and enjoy your life. Thank a lot for this opportunity. Good week for everybody. And once again, I'm so grateful to, to have this time with you. Bye-bye, guys. See you. That's all. Bye-bye, my friend.